Okay, welcome to the final class of World Religions and Cults. And uh, we're going to spend some time uh, talking about how to make sure we don't end up ourselves. You might think you would never end up in a cult. But like I said, my friend Benny, who ended up in a cult, I have a friend named Trish, um, who uh, used to be part of, uh, of our extended family, um, who is now an, a complete atheist, um, who used to work uh, in my uh, ministry and be the head of uh, a big department in my ministry. How in the world did that happen? Um, well, let's look first at the two most uh, misquoted verses in history. And, um, and then we're going to look at another one that's not even in the Bible, but quoted as if it is in the Bible. <laughs> so um, I think it's really important that we see this um, uh, and, and the reason that I'm bringing them up. All right. Uh, this, this one's been misquoted. I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has revealed to them, uh, what God has, has for them um, that love him. Um, and so, so the scripture, a lot of people will say, hey, nobody's seen, nobody's heard. It hasn't even entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for them. All right? Um, and, and, and what they... Are trying to say by that is that you can't know all right without help you know without another teacher to teach you or without someone to show you um, it, it, you know your eyes can't even see what God has for you your ears could never understand what God he's you know his thoughts are too high and so forth and that's another one there the second one it says uh, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways and they're past finding out. How many of you heard that one before? You know, God's ways are so high. They're fast. They're, they're beyond our ability to figure them out. Well, that causes people to fall into a place where they actually um, uh, think that they can't know the truth uh, fully. Because, you know, because, you know, I hasn't, you know, our eyes and our ears haven't seen. And, and God's thoughts are so much higher that how could we know the truth for sure? How can we know for sure that we have the truth? Well, those, I say they're misquoted. They're, they're quoted right, but they're quoted out of context. Might be a better way of saying it. That they're, they're, they're out of context. Let's look at the actual context, all right? So we'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll look at verse number 9. And, but this time, we're going to read a little bit more. Uh, and then suddenly you'll say, oh, I see. He wasn't saying that we can't know. Um, what God's prepared for us, not at all. In fact, just the opposite. <laughs> That's the problem when you quote just one verse um, and you don't quote the rest of it, all right? So 1 Corinthians 2, 9, It is written, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. All right, we just, that's all we hear about, but we never hear the next verse. But, but God has revealed them to us. Through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is of God. Why? So that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. All right, and so the Bible seems to say, oh, we can't know what God has said. You know, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard. But then the Bible continues. You have to keep reading. It says, but God has revealed them to us by the Holy Spirit. And we can know what God wants for our lives. The other one, uh, God's ways are so high. His thoughts are so high. We can never know what God was really thinking. All right. Um, but let's read what it actually says. In Isaiah 55, it says really almost, again, the opposite of that, um, that we can know God's thoughts. Did you know we can know God's thoughts? Um, according to the Scripture, we can know His thoughts. His ways are not too high. They are too high in the natural realm, but God has made a way for us to know them. So let's look at and let's read. Just read. You guys are going to love this. Um, uh, Isaiah 55, verse 8. Um, here's what it says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
So much higher are my thoughts than your thoughts, and my thoughts than your thoughts, and my ways than your ways. And so people have taken that and they've said, you see, God's ways and His thoughts are so far above, we can never know what God thinks. He just thinks too high above us. How could we ever know what God thinks about stuff? They don't read the next verse. Verse 10, But as the rain comes down, and the snow comes down from heaven, and do not return from there, but water the earth, make it bring forth in bud, that it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Watch this. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. All right. But it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it to do. And so here's what he said. God's thoughts are way up there. All right. Way higher than our ways. His ways are so far above ours. But guess what? Just like the rain up there in the sky is way above us, but it comes down here, doesn't it? It rains. And when it rains, what was up there, now it's down here. And it's watering things. And it's making things come alive. In the same way, he said, my word is like that. He said, my word actually um, is in the same way. My thoughts and my ways are found in my word. And in the same way... They are higher than you, and they are way higher than you, the thoughts and the ways of God. But he said, but I have given you the word so that you can know my thoughts, and you can know my ways, and you can get to know what I think about stuff, so you won't be deceived. And, of course, the other one that's quoted all the time is not even in the Bible. But how many of you heard people say God works in mysterious ways? Have you heard that before? Well, God works in mysterious ways. Well, that's not in the Bible. He does not work in mysterious ways. Um, he works in very, uh, uh, very knowable ways. He tells us how he does things. We have a record called the Scripture that tells us exactly what God thinks about everything. All right? So we don't have to ever be deceived by anyone because we can know what God's Word says about something. How did the church deal with cults when it first began? Did you know that it began very early in Christianity? The first time they had to have a summit to discuss a cult happened in Acts chapter 15, and it is so powerful how they dealt with it. Um, and uh, everything of, of the flesh or of the world, uh, one, one of the, well, we'll get into that in a second. That's, uh, uh, I, I wanted to say Gnosticism um, is, uh, is, is the belief that everything, and, 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 uh, and I have right below their Gnosticism, below that paragraph uh, to the right, and, um, but... Gnosticism is the belief that everything is of the flesh and uh, every, everything that's of the flesh or of this world is bad and only spiritual things are good. Therefore, Jesus could not have come in the flesh because if he came in the flesh, he would have been bad and evil. All right. And so, um, and so that's what Gnosticism teaches. That's one of the earliest um, uh, cults or, or false beliefs in the early church. And they would say, we don't have any sin. Because we have reached this nirvana, this place of spiritual enlightenment where we, because uh, the word Gnostic just means knowledge, all right? And so Gnosticism is this idea that, hey, um, uh, you know, I have reached this place where I am spiritual, all right? And therefore, I don't even have sins, all right? Um, because the only people that can have sins is people that are in the flesh, you know? And we're not in the flesh. We're spiritual. We've reached this place of being spiritual. And they would say Jesus didn't actually physically come in the flesh. And that's one of the early um, uh, cults or false religions. The second one um, uh, is a cult that said you must, um, in Acts 15, it says specifically, you must be circumcised and you must follow the law of Moses to be a Christian. Those are the first two heresies. So we'll look at the first one, Acts 15, and then the second one, 1 John. All right, Acts 15 tells us um, how they dealt with this false teaching that was going through the church, that you must be circumcised to be a Christian. And because they said, basically they said, if you're going to be a Christian, you must be a Jew. All right, so you've got to, be, you've got to convert to being a Jew in order to be a Christian. So they were making, uh, they were making uh, Gentiles 
become circumcised and literally follow the dietary laws of, of Moses and the Old Testament to be Christians. So look at this, Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men came down from Jerusalem, or from Judea, and taught the brethren, Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension <laughs> and, debute, and, and, and a dispute with them, in other words, they had a big fight, all right? Um, it says that um, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and elders about this question of should you be um, circumcised and follow the law of Moses to be a Christian. So, being on their way by the church, they passed through some different places and they described the conversion of Gentiles. The Gentiles had actually been converted. They had spoken tongues and everything else. And, they, and it caused them great joy to all the brethren. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported the things um, that God had been doing. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, now they were believers. It says, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up and said, it is necessary to be circumcised, and we must command them to keep the law of Moses. All right? So this was the first council ever all right about a doctrinal problem and here's how they dealt with it it says the apostles and elders came together and they considered the matter they talked about it and watch this and when there had been much dispute so they were fighting about this peter rose up and said to them men and brethren you know good while a while ago god chose us talking about the jews that by the mouth of the Gentiles, they would hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about Cornelius' house in Acts 10, when God chose Peter to go preach the gospel to Cornelius, a Gentile. All right? He said, so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them, the, fair, the, the uh, Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us. You remember they spoke in tongues, uh, just the way that... Uh, Peter had spoken to him. So he said, hey, I know they're saved, and they got the same Holy Spirit we got because they did the same thing we did, all right? And he said, and, and, and God makes no distinction between us Jews and them Gentiles, um, purifying their hearts, how? By faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God? Now, this was bold. They were all fighting, and suddenly Peter had enough and stood up. And he said, why do you now test God by putting a yoke on the neck of these disciples? And listen to this, which neither our fathers nor us were able to bear. So here's what he's saying. You're trying to tell these people they got to be uh, circumcised and they got to follow Moses' law to get to heaven. And you can't even keep Moses' law. And he said, you're trying to put a yoke on them that not even you could do. And it's wrong. And he said, but we believe that we are uh, saved. He said, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they, Gentiles, have been saved. Listen to this. Then the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describing how many miracles and wonders had happened among the Gentiles. And after they became silent, watch this. James confirms Peter's word. I love it. James answers, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, which is Peter, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take them out a people for his name, as it is written in the prophets, just as it is written. And then he names the scripture that says Gentiles will be able to be saved. And then he said this in verse 19, Therefore I judge... I judge that we should give no more trouble to these Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to just abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from eating things strangled and from eating blood. He said, For Moses has had throughout many generations 
those who preach him in every city being read in synagogues every week. And it pleased the apostles and elders and the whole church. And they sent out chosen men of their own company from Antioch, Paul and Barnabas and Judas, a different Judas, of course, and, um, and, and another person named uh, uh, Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote a letter to bring to everyone. And the letter basically said this, they don't have to follow the law of Moses. They don't have to be circumcised. Um, the only thing we ask is that you just um, stay away from idols and don't eat things with blood still in it, you know. And uh, he said, that's all we ask, you know, just don't do that. Things that you know have been offered to idols, don't do that. And, uh, and stay away from that. Other than that, don't put any burden on the people. Just release them and let them have faith in God. So that's how they dealt with that. How'd they deal with it? They got together and they looked at what the Word said and they put it down, all right? And First John puts down the Gnostic view all right, and we won't take time to go there right now because of time, but in 1 John 1, he says this, If you say that you've not sinned, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. He's talking to Gnostics who believe that they haven't even sinned. He said, but if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And then he goes on down, and, and, and he says in chapter 2, he says, Hey, anybody, anybody that says Jesus has not come in the flesh is a deceiver and is a false prophet and uh, anybody that says that Jesus didn't come in the flesh is not born of God. Here's what he said, you're not a Christian if you say Jesus didn't come in the flesh. So he attacked this false teaching just right off the bat, all right? Now let's talk about some people in church history that also had to fight against heresy because John fought against Gnosticism. Um, and then Tertullian, um, a great leader in the church in um, about 200 uh, um, A.D., Tertullian fought against a radical movement um, that was misrepresented. It was misrepresenting the Trinity. He wrote many great works um, as the first one to clearly define the Trinity. Did you know that Tertullian is the first person to ever clearly define what the Trinity is? To this day, we still hold to his teaching on what the Trinity is. Um, he explained it better than anybody. He wrote a book called Against uh, Praxis, and he refuted Gnosticism also. He also wrote great books um, on apology or apologetics. Um, it was a book called Apology, which is apologetics. And it defends the church against the persecution by the state, and it explained the principle of uh, religious liberty as an inalienable right for all people. He affirmed the priesthood of every believer, that everybody's a priest. He said that the Trinity, um, he talked about the Trinity when defending false teaching. And he said, um, he said that this is what's been said, all right? He defended against a false teaching that said this. There are three, uh, he said, uh, these three are one substance but not one person. He didn't say that, but uh, he was fighting against that statement. All right, that was a statement that was being said. And he, he was saying, that's false. All right, it's not one person, it's three persons and one God. And again, we can't always understand that because I, we have a little human brain, all right, and God is huge. But he's saying, it's false. If you go around saying there's, one, there's three substances but one person, you are not correctly teaching uh, the Trinity. In order to teach the Trinity, you must teach there is one God manifested in three individual distinct persons. And he said it's very important. And because of him, we have that. Um, and he is responsible for helping us know this. He was actually branded a heretic late in life for defending Montanism. But later, the church rescinded his judgment of being a heretic uh, because they realized all of what he had did uh, all the early writings and all the things that helped the church and even the thing that he did by uh, standing up for that particular belief system wasn't egregious or something that was terrible. Um, they, were just, uh, they were just a little jealous of him. Um, and five popular uh, uh, cults that are going on today and, and then we're going to hit uh, some um, uh, particular verses that help us uh, stay free from it. We're not going to go through all these but I wanted you to have them. 
We've talked about some of them, but these are five today, right now, that have the most influence, all right? So, so earlier we talked about eight very prominent ones that are alive today, but these are what uh, people consider the five most, um, I guess, uh, uh, prominent um, in, their, in their doctrine and their beliefs and all of that. So the five are most popular, I guess, the ones with the biggest followings, okay? These five have the biggest followings, and some of them, I, I think most of these I didn't talk about, and I only talked about Scientology. So first one is called the Unification Church. You can read about it. Um, Sun Moon uh, is the one that, you ever heard of the Moonies? Anybody ever heard of the Moonies? Um, Moonies are, you know, they wear a, a long hat, and uh, they're always asking for money. Uh, they, uh, that is, the Moonies were created by this guy, and they have a huge following even to this day, a massive following. You can read all the things there that, uh, that, I, that I wrote and uh, learn a little bit about the, the church that's the Unification Church, all right? Secondly, Scientology, um, which we already went into great detail, but listen to this. It is huge in the United States, and they prey on those who are going through tough mental situations. Scientology is a highly litigious, um, uh, 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 very dangerous, wealthy, and widespread cult. And uh, some people have actually listed it as a legitimate religion, but it is not a legitimate religion. Did you know they have not found the president's, the current president um, of, of uh, Scientology? His wife's been missing for 10 years, and nobody can find her. And uh, when they try to do investigations, they get shut down left and right, and they're, they're not allowed. The police even can't even get out there to try to find her. Nobody's heard from her for 10 years. They're, a, they're an evil group. Um, the, the, the third one that's very, 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 very popular is the Church Universal and Triumphant. I like the name. It's kind of cool. But uh, founded by Elizabeth uh, Clare, so-called a prophet, 1975. And uh, Elizabeth Clare, this prophet, uh, founded the Church Universal Triumphant based on some of the existing teachings of her husband. And as far as cults go, this is one of that you might say relatively harmless if you first looked at it because a lot of the elements of Christianity are found there. But she also adds ideas of uh, chara and karma and makes appearances in many different religions, actually, uh, uh, through the church universal and triumphant. The main reason for the negative attention of this active current cult, um, even though it's very popular, stems back to the prophet and her husband telling followers that nuclear war was coming. They even gave dates, and it didn't happen, of course. Um, this led to many people building expensive fallout shelters. They spent all their savings. Imagine that. They got people to spend all their savings because they told them there's a certain day everything's going to blow up and all these things are going to happen. And they spent their life savings building these shelters that they never even needed. Um, and uh, the prophet's husband ended up being arrested for uh, having firearms when he didn't, wasn't allowed to have them um, using a fake ID. And uh, the whole group began to hyper-focus on the end of the world, which most of them do, and it uh, caused them some great trouble. Mormonism is not Christianity. I can't say that strong enough. It is not Christianity for many reasons. First of all, they put the uh, word of Joseph Smith and all their prophets on the same level as the Bible. All right? They put the word of Joseph Smith on the same level as the Bible, all right? And uh, one man, by the way, this man claims to have found these golden plates with all this truth written on it. Problem is nobody else has ever seen the plates. Only he saw it. The angel Marcion showed up, showed him the plates, and then hid them, and nobody's ever found them, including, including Joseph Smith. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the, the famous BYU, Brigham Young University. Brigham Young was the second prophet of the Mormon church and he continued the lies he knew they were lies there's so much proof that he knew joseph smith was a liar and they killed joseph smith he was a martyr that's what made him so popular he became a martyr but but brigham young became one of the most popular leaders in american culture and there's a whole university a famous university named after him um uh byu and so um but uh <clears throat> founded in 1930 by a lot of violence and war. Did you know there was a war that went on for almost a year with the United States government with shooting each other and on horseback, uh, fighting and killing for territory? And 
the Mormons were trying, they killed hundreds and hundreds of people. They were trying to take over an entire land in Utah and make it a sovereign nation that wasn't the United States. And of course they did not win. <laughs> they got shot down and destroyed eventually. Um, labeling an, an organization as an active cult is controversial, this particular one, um, because Mormonism, some people think, is really no different than any you know, denomination of Christianity. But some sects of, Mormon, some sects of, 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 of uh, Mormons or, or, or different groups of Mormons do not behave like cults at all. That's why some of them seem to be more mainstream um, and therefore don't seem to really be dangerous. Um, Mormons are often Christians who believe Joseph Smith had a shared vision. And so, in other words, there are some people who are Christians who are just deceived. They do believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, all right, but they are just deceived and follow some of the teachings of Joseph Smith. So even though they're in a cult, some, some of them genuinely do believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and are Christians. So I want to be clear about that. There are some Christian Mormons, just like there are some Christian Catholics and Christian other groups uh, that, that just have some um, false understanding, but they're Christians. Um, and uh, ultimately, some of the early wisdom imparted by Joseph Smith caused his followers to become polygamist. They outlawed it later because they were going to jail so much, uh, but fundamentalists continue to this day. Uh, I saw a very disturbing documentary on, uh, on a group of, uh, of fundamentalist uh, LDS uh, people, and uh, one of them is in prison for the rest of his life um, because he, was, he had taken on almost 100 wives. Uh, they were 12 years old, 13 years old. I mean, this is just sick stuff. And he claimed to have been going off the original teachings, and unfortunately it seems to be true, he was going off the original teachings of the Latter-day Saints Church. So Mormonism called the Latter-day Saints Church is not the truth and is not part of Christianity. It is a cult. Um, <clears throat> so what does the Bible teach about false prophets and prophecies? How to avoid falling prey to a charismatic leader and to a cult. All right, look at Co Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. First of all, we've got to learn to... Um, to, to uh, we got to learn to preach, um, or scar sorry, learning to follow preaching and being filled with God's word, not man's word. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. There's two points found here in Colossians. Two points. One point is we need to be full of the word of God ourselves. The second point is we need to be led by the peace of God in our heart and not by some individual person. All right? So Colossians chapter 3, verse um, 15. Let me see here. Oh, I'm in Galatians. That's why it's not making sense. All right, there we go. All right, Colossians 3. Verse 15. Listen to this. And let the peace of God rule your heart to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. So what did he say should rule our heart? God's peace. So we don't need to be led by you know, some man or some group. Our heart leads us through peace. All right. Secondly, what should we do? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word and deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is pretty simple here. It's saying stay together with other believers. Sing together about the things of God. Sing spiritual songs and talk about the word. And let the word of God dwell in you richly. If you've got the word strong in your heart, and, and if you're led by only peace, the peace the Holy Spirit brings, you're not going to follow the voice of a stranger. All right? So don't follow a man. Galatians 1 teaches this. You don't have to read it right now, but you can go back and look at it. It says this. Paul says something crazy. He says, hey, even if I come back or an angel from heaven shows up in your house and tries to tell you a different gospel than the one I've already told you, let him be accursed. He said, even let me be cursed. If I come back and try to teach you something, 
besides what I've already taught. Let me be cursed. And he said, if even if an angel shows up to you, well, what happened with Joseph Smith? An angel showed up. And the Bible says, if an angel shows up, don't believe him if it's different than what I said here. Because he said, the gospel has been preached fully. And anything other than the gospel is going to be accursed if you believe it. And so make sure that you don't do that. All right. And so um, uh, he said it brings a curse. So Revelation says don't add or take away from the book, all right, from the scripture, because there's dire circumstances if we do so. All right. Well, what about Hebrews 13, 7? It says remember your leaders and follow them and do what they say and obey them. Well, we should do that to a point. But you got to read verse 8 too. Verse 8 says, this, it says, follow the end of their faith. Follow the, where their faith is taking them. And you know what it says next? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we only follow them as long as they are teaching Jesus and that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right. So we follow our leaders and we're obedient to them and we do what they say as long as they're leading us to Christ. But the moment they start leading us to something else, like them, you know, uh, and reverence to them and so forth, now we have moved into an area that, um, uh, that, that, is, that is wrong. And so we only follow and obey our leaders as long as they are following Jesus and teaching Jesus, all right? And so um, a friend of mine said that the word heresy is brought up too often about everything, and I agree with him. I think we call too many things heresy. We say, oh, this is heresy. Oh, that's heresy. And I think sometimes we use that word a little bit too easily. Everything that is wrong is not heresy, okay? Um, in other words, uh, let me give you guys something that will help you in learning the Bible, okay, in knowing the Bible. Um, and I want you to remember these three things um, and, um, you know, and maybe, maybe, they, maybe they, they're, they're not in my current notes, but maybe they should be. Um, which is three things related to the scripture that is okay to do. Um, number one, absolutes. Absolutes of scripture, they cannot be altered. All right, These are things that must be preached, like the Bible is the only word of God. All right, The deity of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection. All right, The things that are, that are absolutes. Like, we know this is facts, all right? But it's okay to have two other things, too. There's something called interpretations, all right? There are some interpretations, and it doesn't make somebody a heretic just because they have an interpretation of something that's different than you, all right? So one group believes that there's a rapture that's going to happen before the tribulation. Another group says the rapture is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. Another group says the rapture is going to happen at the end of the tribulation. Some people say there is no tribulation. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are they heretics? No, they're not heretics. They just have interpretations, all right? Um, that doesn't rise to the level of being a heretic. And then there's a third thing that we call deductions, all right? That's even a lower level than, than interpretation. That's not where you just make an interpretation. A deduction is where you take this verse, that verse, another verse, and you just make a deduction from it. Um, that's not heresy. Um, so to give you an idea, the Bible says Jesus preached to those in prison, you know, and people take that verse and then they take the verse where it says that uh, he made a show of the devil openly, uh, triumphing over him in it, and they take a few verses, they put them together, and they deduce that Jesus died, and when he died, that he went to hell and physically fought the devil and took away the keys and made a show of him in hell and then emptied hell and took those who, like Abraham and all of them, up to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that specifically. You have to take a bunch of scriptures and you have to deduce that. That's a deduction. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily heresy, all right? It's just a deduction. You just, you've just deduced that this is true. So there's absolutes that, that you cannot change. They have to be the same. Um, they have to be correct. There's interpretations that can be a little bit different, um, and then there's deductions, all right? Those are acceptable, um, but heresy is not acceptable, and so, um, and, and, but the word's been overused. Sometimes we call somebody's deduction about the end times a heresy, 
you know, and uh, we shouldn't do that. So, what does the Bible say um, about what, uh, in other words, what does the Bible say false teaching is and what does it call false teaching specifically? Well, first it says a lot about false teachers. There's way too much to write down. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it says false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive many, if possible, even the elect. Um, uh, Proverbs 24, 24 talks about false prophets. Uh, Matthew 16, all of those verses, like I say, because of time, we don't have time to read all those, but I do want to read the second Peter. Um, read second Peter, um, chapter number one, verse number 12 through 21. Second Peter, chapter one, verse 12 through 31, because to 21, because this is powerful words that Peter says about false teachers. And I want you to hear this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Here's what it says. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, this body, to stir you up by reminding you that... Um, uh, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. In other words, he knows he's going to die soon. And he says, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. In other words, Jesus told him he was going to die by crucifixion. Um, and so he said, just like Jesus told me, I'm going to die soon. And he said, moreover, I'm going to be careful to ensure that you always keep these things in mind. All right. And, uh, and, then, and then look what he says. For we did not follow cunning, devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God uh, the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to Him from heaven, from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven. We are with Him on the holy mountain. We were with Him on the holy mountain. And we know the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Knowing this, watch this, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit. He said, hey, we did none of these prophecies that us apostles preached about. We didn't get this from human wisdom. All right? We got this by the Holy Spirit who moved on us and told us the words that are to be said. And he's, what he's saying is, I'm about to die. And I want to make sure that you don't get led astray. So make sure you stick to the gospel that we've been preaching to you right here. You know that the early church fathers... That which means the very first generation after the apostles. The, the, uh, uh, Polycarp was a disciple of John. And he had a disciple named Irenaeus. Both of them taught and spoke. Um, uh, if you took the writings of the first and second generation right after the apostles, if you took their writing, did you know they had already decided what the New Testament was? Many people think that uh, Constantine decided um, in 400 you know, A.D., uh, that he got a group together and said, okay, you guys decide what's the New Testament and which scriptures are going to use and not use. No, no, no. Um, it was already decided. Peter, James, John, they all, by the Holy Spirit, said Thomas's gospel is not inspired by God. You know, Mary's gospel is not inspired by God. You know, this one is. You know, they knew by the Holy Spirit which ones were, and, 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 and the disciples' disciples their disciples said, if, in fact, you can take their writings and you can re-put together the whole New Testament. Do you know that? If we lost the New Testament and we didn't have 27 copies, we have 27,000 copies of the original New Testament, <laughs> handwritten copies. All right, that's how we know that, that it's true. You know, we have, we have so many copies. Second place is the Iliad, and they only have five copies. All right, and they're a thousand years older than the original when it, when it happened. Uh, we have writings... 27,000 copies that happened right after the time when it actually happened. All right, no other 
uh, historical uh, book is that accurate. But here's what he's saying. You don't, there's no private interpretation. You can't come up with your own way of, of, of saying something. All right, That the Holy Spirit means what he says in the context in which he said it. And he said it by the Holy Spirit. And he said, make sure that you don't follow destructive doctrines. And then and when you get a chance, you can read chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter uh, th 2 and 3. He goes and he talks about all the false doctrines that's being uh, taught and all the false teachers and the dangers that they bring. Okay, And so let's move on here. Um, what does the Bible call false teaching? Did you know this is the only thing specifically the Bible calls false teaching? A lot of us in 1 John. Uh, it's in some other places. Um, it says anyone who, call, who says that Jesus did not come in the flesh is a is is a heretic you know is is not born of god is a false teacher all right um so that's 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 false teaching uh what else is false teaching whoever says that jesus excuse me whoever says that they never sinned that's heresy it's heresy to say that you never sinned he said anyone that says jesus isn't the messiah all right that is heresy that's false prophecy that's false preaching and teaching anyone who says there's another way to heaven outside of salvation that is heresy because Peter said, uh, I believe in Acts uh, 3, verse 12, I think it is. He said, there is no other name, maybe chapter 4, verse 12. It says, there's no other name, uh, and, and verse 13, under heaven whereby men can be saved except the name of Jesus. So anyone who teaches there's another way besides Jesus, that's false teaching. That is heresy. And the infallibility of Scripture. Anybody that tries to say this Scripture isn't the only way, the only truth, and this Scripture isn't inspired Word of God, they are a false group, and they are false teaching. Now, I uh, won't read everything else. You've got it there, but I will tell you about it in just a, a quick moment here. Um, uh, Trish B., um, she was a woman who led my... Uh, group. Um, she was in charge of all of our um, uh, people that visited for the first time and all that kind of stuff. She was a strong Christian for 30 years. She went to my parents' church. She went to my church, uh, loved the Lord, but she got involved with this universalist group. Now, at first, I was attracted to the group because they were teaching things I'd never heard, and some of it was right about salvation not being by works, and, and I was being set free from some legalism, and they were saying some really good stuff, but I began to realize they all had something in common. They all had kids that were gay, and, um, and they were looking for a reason to feel better about it, all right? So they're all going to this group saying, oh, don't worry, everyone's saved, you know? God's redeemed the whole world. And they had a couple of verses they used. The problem is you can't take the whole word of God and say that the whole world is saved. Sorry, you just can't do that. Uh, it just doesn't teach that. There's a couple of verses that seem to say that, but when you read everything in context, it doesn't say that. Um, and this group began to actually um, get in my head a little bit. I didn't always have an answer for them, but um, the way they were doing it and the way they tricked her into ultimately falling off, completely falling into a ditch. I mean, she actually does Buddhist stuff and believes we're all one with the universe and there's no life after death. We're just dead when we die. And this is a woman I used to respect and think she was one of the most godly persons ever. She used to give towards mission trips and everything. And now she believes this. How did this new form of, 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 of universalism get a hold of so many Christians that were my friends? Well, they followed a charismatic leader. <laughs> uh, there was a guy that had a really good personality. Mike Williams was his name. And he had a great personality. He was fun to be around. And he taught uh, things that seemed to be right. And it seemed like he was telling us, hey, what, we, what you've been taught in the Bible was wrong. You were taught this way because they were trying to control you. But here's what the Bible actually said. And he started twisting the scriptures. And at first I thought, oh, that, that sounds right. But then something in my spirit, what? I was led by peace. The Word of God was in me richly, right? So at some point I went, hold on a second now. And I started challenging everything he said right to his face. And he never had a good answer for it, all right? And that's when I pulled away from him. Thank God that I did because everybody that's followed him have fallen off the rail and fallen off. And like, did you know some of them have become atheists? Many of them, not just Trish, multiple of them. Started out as universalists, believing everybody could be saved. Now they don't even believe in God at all. Uh, do you know how that happened? Because the Bible. They begin to, their leaders begin to challenge the validity of the Bible. First, they claimed that Jesus said 
Only the law, the prophets, and the Psalms is the Bible. Um, and everything else is not inspired. Jesus did not say that, all right? They took something way out of context. Jesus said, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms speak of me. You've been trying to find life in them, but they speak of me. He didn't say that's only the scripture and everything else is not scripture. They said that because they didn't like James and John and Peter's preaching because it was judgment and fire and damnation and they didn't like to hear all that. So they wanted to discount all those things. And, and, uh, and, and then uh, it led them to saying that Paul is the only one that understood the gospel, that Peter, James, and John were all legalistic and they didn't know the truth. All right, so they started questioning that. But Peter and James and John were the closest ones to Jesus of all of them. How can we say that they're not saying the truth? Um, and then they started saying stuff about the law of Moses that they didn't like about uh, slaves and women. And that caused them to start saying that even the Old Testament wasn't inspired, that none of it's inspired, that it's just man's commentary on what God is saying. And that led them down a path to many of them becoming atheists. Once, because once you no longer have a Bible and you don't know a truth, you have nothing to stand on as the truth, then of course you can fall into uh, atheism because you're like, well, if, this is, if nothing in this is for sure true and I don't know for sure, then what do I have to stand on? All right? And, uh, and so challenging the validity of the Word of God, for instance, at one point before they went all the way and said the whole Bible is not even inspired, they said Jesus' words, we don't have to follow, all right, because they're under the law. And we don't have to follow, all right? They, were, they, they contradicted themselves all the time. But Luke 16, 16 and 17 says that Jesus pre did not preach under the law, but his message was a New Testament message. So we do have to follow Jesus' message. And by the way, we have to follow some of the Old Testament too, you know? No, we don't have to sacrifice animals, but we need to be moral and live righteous. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, finally, uh, Matthew uh, 7 tells us that, that some people, first of all, it says, he's going to say to many people, Lord, Lord, did we not, pro that people are going to say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do good works in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. It's not as much important that you know Jesus. It's more important that he knows who you are. All right? And he only going to know who you are by you putting your faith in him. But that verse 24 of Matthew 7 says, some people are founded on a rock. And when the storms come, they get blown down because they don't obey my words. He said, other people who obey my words, the storm's still going to come, but it's not going to blow them down. All right? And so, guys, if you will fill yourself with the Word of God, if you will keep yourself surrounded by people who are solid, and they also believe that the Bible is the standard, if you will make sure you keep this as the standard, that you follow the peace in your heart, the Holy Spirit, and don't ever let a man or a woman that's charismatic, that has a great personality, become a God to you, that you follow everything that they say without even checking it. All right, then you can protect yourself. All right, does that make sense? All right, thank you guys for staying a little extra, and uh, we're going we're gonna to lock down. Thank you so much for being a part of World Religions and Cults, and uh, we've got another great class that will be coming to you next. Uh, if you haven't got a chance, um, there are now six courses that are available on uh, Synergy Bible College um, uh, right now on YouTube. Uh, but if you want to actually get credit for the classes, you have to register for them so you can actually uh, do the, uh, uh, in the future, you can write papers and whatever is required of you. So make sure that you, uh, that you go to SynergySchools.com and that you actually sign up if you want credit for going to the classes. Um, otherwise, you can watch any of them for free, share them with your friends. We want everyone to hear the Word of God. All right, we'll see you next time very soon. God bless you guys.